Welcome back to another edition of Inside Great Lakes Sailing. My name is Greg Norman, your host, and we are fortunate enough to have one of the great journalists, authors, and broadcasters in uh, on this planet. And uh, I'm talking with Tom Cunliffe, who's a an unbelievable author, and we're going to talk about your career and in, in the books and YouTube and all the all that goes with it. But I want to start with the simplest of questions: Why sailing? Well, um, <laughs> that's a big question, isn't it? Um, why sailing? Well, I never really wanted to do anything else. I discovered sailing when I was 14 years old. And I had a sort of rather a magical experience. My, my, my dad decided I need to make some decisions for myself. And he sent me and my little mate from around the corner. He sent us off to a place called the Norfolk Broads, which is uh, some inland waterways in, uh, well, in Norfolk. And... You can hire little cruising boats there, little boats with cabins, and you can go sailing. And that's what they did. They sent us on a train from where we lived, which was on the other side of England, up in the industrial northwest. Uh, and, and we got on this train and we went to, we, were, we, were, we got off the train at uh, um, a place called uh, St. Olive's in, in, in Norfolk. And, and we found a boatyard there uh, where our dad said, must have lied about our age. To, to get us to charter this boat, because we knew nothing, absolutely nothing. <laughs> All we had was a textbook, but written by a bloke called Peter Heaton, who I'm not sure I'd give a job to now. I don't think he's all that good, really, but the book, that's the book we had. And it was about all there was then, because we're looking at 19, when, oh, goodness me, when was this? 1961, this was. And um, uh, we got off the, we got off the train and got on the boat. The bloke gave us the boat and, 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 and sent us on our way. And, um, we did what it said in the book, and, and the boat sailed, and it was windy. And it was the most magical moment, because it was a gaff sloop, this boat, 24 feet long. And we pulled the sails on. They, they looked huge. I couldn't believe how big they looked, because uh, when you've never been on a boat before, and you pull the sails up, they do look big. And I'll never forget that. And it was windy. It was blowing about 20 knots. And um, they were crash banging all over the place because we were head to wind. We did what it said in the book and we tied the boat. The boat had no engine uh, and we tied it up to the bank with a piece of rope and and, and, and so it would be head to wind. And um, up went the sails and we let go of the piece of rope. We pulled the jib back, as it said in the book, and the, the boat turned around and phew, mainsail filled and off it went. And uh, th this was a, a seminal moment in my life because the, the, the fact that this boat was careering off down the river uh, at such high speed with no noise at all. And uh, it was tiller steered. And uh, we made the few obvious first mistakes with that, but we were young and so we learned fast and we got a grip on that. And the boat just went along and the, the reeds were bowing in the wind and the birds were singing and the clouds were ripping across the sky. And I never wanted to do anything else after that. So that was it. That's how it all started. In retrospect, you have a seminal moment at the age of 14 or 15. You find that remarkable? Because that's not true in most cases. Well, I don't know, really. Um, I don't know how other people start. I mean, the really lucky ones start when they're very young, like my grandsons, who went off to sea, went off in their parents' boat before they could walk, and as indeed did my daughter. Um, but it wasn't like that for me, because nobody sailed in my family. There was no background, whatever. Um, and uh, that was it. But I read a lot of books then about, 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 about people going cruising in the 1930s and the 50s. And uh, I was very turned on by that. I thought I'd like to do that. And one particular book I read was by uh, an American called Bill Robinson, who wrote a book called Deep Water and Shoal. Yep. Very famous American yachtsman. And he had no money, and I didn't. And he bought this boat for next to nothing, and he sailed off around the world and had all manner of adventures and wrote a thumping good book. And um, I thought, well, I perhaps could do something like that, but I have to get some money from somewhere. And so... Um, I went to university and I was going to be a lawyer. I was at law school. And uh, in my last holiday, we used to get these long holidays. Everybody does when they're a student. They're nice long holidays and so on. In my final holiday, uh, I, I came to America. And in those days, uh, for 50 quid, that's 50 pounds sterling to you. Um, what's that? About 60, 65 dollars. Uh, you could get on a, a Pan American Boeing 707 and you could fly across the Atlantic and you'd be decanted off this airplane at JFK. And and then you were on your own for three months until they flew you back home again. 
Uh, it was called the British Universities of North America Club. And they arranged this deal with, with, with Pan Am. So I got off the aeroplane and uh, knocked around for a bit. But to cut a long story short, I ended up on Cape Cod, where I saw the, uh, the schooner Hindu, which was working as a headboat off the end of the pier at Provincetown. And I thought I'd never seen anything so great in my life. Uh, and I walked down there and, uh, and um, being an optimist, I asked the skipper if he needed any hands. I didn't expect he would. As it turned out, he did, because his, 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 his number two boy was paying off the next day. And he said, well, it looks like you're sent from God. But I don't know if you'll be any good or not, but you can sail with us tomorrow. If you're any good, you can stay for the summer. And, um, and I did. And it worked out. And Captain Justin Avalar uh, taught me uh, an enormous amount about deck seamanship and about how to behave on a boat. And he also taught me how to polish brass, which was my first job. And, 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 and so that set me off. And at the end of that summer, I did money. I thought, well, you know, why do I want to go back to law school and go through all that wretchedness that I don't really want to do? I want to go sailing. I'll become a professional sailor. So that's what happened. Most people think of professional sailors as guys who race. Now, you obviously took the cruising world. Yeah. Was there, ever a, was there ever an interest in heading towards the race course or you were happy just being a cruiser? Well, um, it's not just being a cruiser, actually. Um, I've been to places that would make some of these racing guys make their hair curl. Yeah. But um, uh, it's, it's just a different discipline. Uh, I have raced. Yes, I raced. Uh, in fact, in the early 80s, I was skipper of the Royal Ocean Racing Club boat and did all the rock races up and down the channel and here and there. So, yes, and I got paid for that. So, yes, I have done, I have done, I have done racing. And uh, I've done a lot of classic boat racing, classic yacht racing. But I have no interest whatever in uh, in big-time racing now. I don't even watch it. I'm not bothered about it, really. Okay. I'm not, I mean, the Volvo the Volvo race, what's it called now, the Ocean Race. Uh, you know, they're all sitting in a, they're all sitting in a cabin um, going around, winding winches, having a chat. Okay. Um, I mean, when you look at the early Whitbread racing films, that is absolutely thrilling. I actually was so turned on by that that I tried to raise sponsorship to to put a boat in for one of the early Whitbread races. What a magnificent thing that was. Um, but that's all over now. And it's become really, it's too technical for me. I'm not that interested in it anymore. In the early part of your career, before you started writing, you obviously covered a variety. You, you were junior sailing directors and you had all kinds of professional oh. jobs. You spent some time in France. Was that when you really got your, you received your, you know, sort of apprenticeship to learn about all the things that you eventually talked to us on YouTube about? Is that where all that came from? Not really. Um, the, um, well, it did. Yes. Yes, it does. It comes from there. Sorry, I'm not looking at it. I'm just pouring myself another cup of tea, actually. You're fine. Out of, You're fine. Out of my, out of my excellent little teapot here. <laughs> um, and, um, there we are. Sorry, I'm just draining the tea strainer. I'll put a little put a little drop of milk in, and then I'll tell yeah. you what happened. All right. Um, right here we go. Yeah, the um, my experience, a lot of it, the the really hard experience has come from my own my own cruising, <laughs> and um, after all sorts of adventures in other sorts of boats, my wife and I bought a little boat. Uh, designed and built by Colin Archer in 1903 in Norway, the real thing. This was a Norwegian pilot cutter. And um, and we sailed her to Brazil. Uh, she basically didn't have an engine. There was one in there, but it never, ever worked. So um, so essentially we did that. And, uh, and we, we were away in her for two or three years. And, uh, and when we got home, we came home to England and, uh, and uh, had a baby, as you do. Uh, and then I worked for a short while in the Merchant Navy here, because in those days, if you had a if you had a, a yacht captain's ticket, you could work as as mate on a, a small proper coasting ship. So I did that. And that taught me a great deal about ship handling. Uh, taught me a bit about people as well, actually. But that's probably another story. But the um, the 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 um, the big thing was that after six months of that, I realized that this wasn't what I'd left law school for, and, and really I should be sailing. And, and I went to the National Sailing School, uh, Sailing Centre as it was called, in Cowes, to get an instructor's ticket. I already had a Yacht Master's ticket. And while I was there, 
uh, the guy who was the permanent instructor who examined me, because this was really an examination, this so-called course for, for instructor, he said, well, look, you've done quite well at this and I'm leaving in a month's time. Why don't you apply for my job? Because he got a picture of me by then. You were five days at sea with these guys and you you, you got a pretty good hand on it. Uh, so I applied and I got the job. So we moved from, because uh, we, we, we had a bit of luck, really, because we sold the little boat when we had the baby, uh, 32 footer she was. Um, we sold her and we bought with the money. We bought a cottage in Devon and a nice little gaff cutter all for cash so that was great so we were well set then but it didn't last long because we then had to move to the isle of Wight, where cows is so we sold that cottage and we bought a nice house on the back of the isle of Wight. and i always said i could see america from the upstairs windows because we look right out down the english channel it's glorious and um you know the great gales would come up in the winter time and there would be uh, there would be there would be salt on the inside of the windows because the, the house was built in 1620 and all the windows leaked and everything. It was pretty desperate, really, but it was a beautiful house. And um, uh, I worked there for four years uh, at the National Sailing Centre. And I worked with some remarkable people. We had, uh, I mean, one particular guy who stands out was Rod Carr, who, was, who became the British Olympic coach and was director of British Olympic sailing for quite a long time. And in fact, you're probably aware that the... Uh, the small boat sailors in Britain do very, very well in these competitions. And uh, that was down to Rod. And I worked with Rod. I actually used to race with him in a Wayfarer dinghy because we were two great big guys, you know. And um, when it was really windy, uh, we were unbeatable. I remember sitting on the outside of the Wayfarer one day, planing along as fast as the poor old thing could go. And Rod said, you know, you can't beat two fat men sitting on the windward rail, he said. And, uh, and that was the way it was. We had, God, we had some fun with that. And that was the time that I, I, I drove the Royal Ocean Racing Club boat as well. And uh, to, in the early days, I navigated that for, for Rod and for, for various other people who were, well, really good racing skippers. And, and that all went, went well. And, but most of the time that I was there, I was examining um, for people for their Yachtmasters tickets and for their instructor's tickets in due course, because I became what's called an instructor exam, which is uh, examiner, which is a fairly high level examiner, really. And um, so, so that, that went on for four years. And I refined the technical side of my knowledge while I was there doing that. Okay. Because at that level, you really can't get away with not being on top of the job. And um, so, well, I had to make sure I knew what I was talking about. Because before that, really, um, it was pure experience. But with that job, I, I honed in with, with what you actually had to know. And I wrote some courses. I wrote the first astro navigation course for the National School. And in fact, I based my astro navigation book, Celestial Navigation, on that course. And it is the world's best selling navigation textbook for, uh, for celestial navigation still. Uh, and again, it was having to teach it that refined my own knowledge. There's nothing like it, is there? Teaching. No. I I want to take you back just for one second. You mentioned you bought yeah, a yeah. boat and it didn't have an engine in it. Did it occur to you that most boats do have engines in, in the modern day? And that it was just, you didn't think twice about it. You just went sailing. Well, yeah, because uh, yeah, the boat didn't have an engine. Most of them didn't in those days in that particular place. It was okay. perfectly normal not to have an engine. All right. So that was so, so you had to sail. And this, 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 having to sail a boat with some tonnage. Uh, with no engine, does give you a different mindset from the man who can always turn the key and just propel, propel himself into the wind's eye for further than this boat can carry its own way. No doubt. <laughs> no doubt. Well, out of university, you, you make this right-hand turn, you spend the next 10, 12, 15 years learning about the sport and, and gaining the knowledge. Somewhere in the mid-80s, you decide to pick up a pen and start to write. Yeah. How did that, that happen? Talk about that transition. Yeah, that's a good question. That that happened when we came back from our second big ocean trip, which took place um, when we left Cows. Uh, we sold the big house on the back of the Isle of Wight, and with the proceeds, we bought a 1911 Bristol Channel pilot cutter, which was a 35-ton gaff cutter. Um, and in that boat, we sailed to the United States via the Arctic. We followed the, the North north atlantic route to well vinland effectively and then on down to newport where we were able to see the uh, australia to lift the america's cup back in what was it 1983 yeah 
that was that was good fun because we turned up in uh, where we hadn't got any money at all as we'd sold everything to buy this boat and go sailing. And we turned up in Newport and they wanted $200 for a night in the marina. And we really wanted to be there because we wanted to support the Aussies. And um, we found that uh, we met these guys who went fishing in, down at the end of Washington Street. Uh, they were, they were, um, they were colored guys. And they said, look, you can tie your boat up down here. Nobody's going to bother you. And we, we tied the boat up to park benches in a little inlet at the bottom of Washington Street. And... Um, after two or three days, a cop came along. He stopped his car and he wandered over and he said, you know, what are you guys doing here? I mean, who are you paying? What's the harm I must say? I said, well, you know, really, we're not doing any harm. We're not causing any trouble. The harbour master hasn't bothered us. And, um, uh, and they said, well, what about these guys? You must be in their way. I said, well, have a chat with them. And they weren't. They were great because we'd been having a good time with these guys. And um, uh, one gentleman who lived in a big house just across the, across the green, he sent his butler down with drinks and canapes for us one evening because he was so pleased to see us there. It was absolutely wonderful. You know, America, you have a great country, you know. People are very kind. They're very kind. You, are, you guys are very kind to strangers. And, and that's, that has been a big thing for me. But anyway, you wanted to know how I picked up the penny. So we got home from this trip in the end. It was a bit of a carry on. Um, we had our ups and downs, but, uh, but we got home and... We had to do something for a living because uh, I could go on teaching and I did teach for a while, but I was getting a bit fed up with it, really. And um, I do have a, a way with words. I, I come from a long line of preachers and, uh, and, and attorneys um, who are all people who deal with words. And it's in my genes. And so I'd written my father a lot of letters home from South America. My father was a judge um, and I'd written him letters home from South America. And he said, these are good, boy. You know, you ought to put these together and do something with it. You, could, you should be using your pen. So I did. And, uh, and I, I, I settled down. I sent an article in to Yachting Monthly magazine. And it was a most unlikely article. Um, actually, I wrote it while I was still at sea. We wrote it. I wrote it in a mangrove swamp in Martinique um, when there was a very strong wind blowing. And it was called The Simplicity of the Stars. And it was about star navigation. And I submitted this to a mainstream yachting magazine. They wouldn't touch it with a barge pole now, but they did. Uh, they thought, this is great. I'd made sense of this subject and, and, and they published it and they encouraged me to do more. And when I got back to England, I went down to see their office and I walked in and they greeted me well. And essentially, they needed somebody to write their seamanship material who had some clout. Um, and because I'm a yacht master examiner, um, you know, there's not that many people going to argue with me, really. And, and, and so I was able to write this technical stuff. Uh, and, and they found and I found that I could write it in such a way that instead of being didactic and saying, this is what you must do, there's only one way to do it, and it's my way. Um, not a bit of it. You know, the sea's a broad church, and there's usually more than one way to skin the cat. And uh, in my experience, you know, if you're teaching seamanship, the thing to do is say to people, well, look, here's the position. What are you trying to achieve? How can you achieve that with what you've got? Just a simple matter like turning a rope up on a cleat. Um, I won't have people telling me there's only one way to do it. It depends, doesn't it? You might want to use a locking hitch like they do on the schooner Brilliant out of Mystic. You might decide you don't want to do that because you've had a bad experience with it one time. There's all sorts of different ways of doing things. People must think like sailors, not just learn by rote. So this is... This was the philosophy that I propounded in these uh, in these articles that were out for Yachting Monthly. And that went on for quite a while. And then I got a column and became a columnist. And uh, and it spread out. And I, for a long time, I had a column with Sail Magazine in America. And I still write tips for sale every month. I'm in there. Uh, you know, here's, here's three likely tips. Here's things you can do better. Try it like this. And so on. And, and I started writing books. And the books were the big thing, really, because um, in 1988, I think, I sat in the armchair in my little cottage that I'd bought. With, 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 when we got back, we didn't have any money. Um, and, 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 and we saved and saved and scrimped. And in the end, we got just enough to put down on a little tiny cottage in the hills of the north of England. So we did. And we borrowed the rest of the money. So we did that. And I sat in this cottage with um, uh, a 10 by 8 pad on my, on my lap and a... You know, a barrow, one of these, ballpoint pen. And I wrote a book. 
um, and it was called Topsail and Battle Axe. And it was about the making the North American voyage uh, across the North Atlantic via Greenland and Iceland and, and whatnot, um, following the Norse route. Uh, and it was partly about our own voyage, which was full of interest because I had some amazing characters on that boat. And, uh, we had, you know, four guys plus me and the wife and daughter and uh, great characters. And some of them have become quite famous. And um, I interspersed it with the, Nor the Norwegian voyage, the voyage of, of, of Eric the Red and Leif Erikson uh, to Vinland. And I wrote that almost like a novel. But I researched it really hard with a lot of serious intellectual rigor in the research. And I was able to draw certain conclusions about the North Atlantic voyaging um, uh, and about the first discoveries, how Bjarni Herjofsson was blown off course on his way from Iceland to see his dad in Greenland and ended up uh, blown in on shore. And he ended up, I'm convinced he ended up off Newfoundland. Um, I've just had a letter from a Norwegian who told me it was Baffinland. It jolly well wasn't. And he hasn't read my book because if he had, he'd know. But anyway, that's 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 that. that so that book did really well, and it, it actually won a literary award. It got the best book of the sea award, and I got a thousand pounds tax free, which was great. So um, I got a great big check, and it was presented by the admiral at the boat show, and I've still got it. It's nailed up in my garage, the the big check, and it was on it. So I got the money, which was great, and. Uh, that fired me up. And after that, I started writing books and, and, and soon publishers were asking me to write books. And I've written a whole plethora of books about sailing and seamanship and one or two adventure books. I've written a book about riding motorbikes in America, actually, because my wife and I rode a couple of Harley Davidsons around America for 13,000 miles in the 90s. And we're able to draw some conclusions about what happens in the middle of America, because we knew all about the coasts, it's both of them, but not the middle. So we got on the bikes and we had a jolly good ride. So that was fun. But the technical books, just they're great. They go on selling and they provided me with a, with a base income. And actually, I was fascinated to see that you had Paul Kayard on your uh, on your list of good guys who were doing this. And yeah. Paul's a smashing chap. And um, he's U.S. sailing, of course. And, and uh, U.S. sailing and I have a long term relationship. And I've written, I think, two of their current textbooks, which are in print right now are actually written by me. And I think that I think they like a Brit to do it because uh, there's always a difference of opinion, isn't there, between the West and the East Coasts and the like, and sometimes in America. But if you get a Brit to do it, there's no argument really. They can all slag me off and it's okay, you see. We just had on, we just had on uh, Alan Osfield, who's the new uh, CEO for U.S. Sailing. Yeah. Who comes out, who comes out of a basketball background and uh, you, you ran Live Nation. The, the landscape of U.S. sailing is changing a little bit. Paul Kayer just stepped down as the Olympic director. There's there's some internal issues, and the, the organization is changing a little bit as as, as we move forward. Yeah, in a, in, a, in a tough climate. But one of the things I noticed in reading a lot of your stuff is that it's really, and I want to say this in the most common way I can, almost Hemingway, in that you're you're you, you don't not re, it's very easy to read. And very really easy to understand and comprehend and that's a very th hard thing for new writers to understand if you go back to your first book it's it's it, i didn't put it down it's just really well written and i think because the language was simple and as a writer and as a journalist myself you know hemingway wrote as close to the least amount of words possible to make the best description and i think you he did you follow <laughs> that in a in a very terrific way and i think that's certainly uh part of the the charm of your of your pen well, it's kind of you to say so. And um, I must put in here uh, the fact that um, I think it it helps being 70 odd years old, actually, because, uh, you know, when we went to school, we were actually taught how to analyze sentences. You know, <laughs> yeah. I, I know what an adjectival clause is. I can see it coming up the garden path. Most right. people haven't got the faintest idea what that's all about. No, so I, I do have an understanding. And also, I, I, you know, I studied Latin at school. So I have some understanding of the construction of language. But, do you know, the real secret is my wife, my wife, Ros, my shipmate, Ros, who's done it all with me all the way and hasn't got a sailing ticket to her name. She's never passed an exam and thinks the whole thing's beneath contempt. She's just done it. That's all. And um, she is a very literate woman. Every single thing I write, she comes up here, we put it on the screen where you and I are right now, and it's up there. We did it this morning for a column I write for Classic Boat magazine. 
uh, and she reads it out loud to me. And as she's reading it, she says, you know, I don't think much of that. That sentence is clumsy. Let's have a look at it. And that's what we do. We look carefully at a good criticism of what I've written. And then when she's done that, we print it out. She takes it downstairs because nobody can really read on a screen. No. And she looks at the printout. She reads it through. And perhaps if I've used the same strong word twice in two sentences, you know how it is. It's easy to do, isn't it? She'll ring it and put a little note. And then it comes up to me again. And I look at it. She'll walk me through it. Do it. And then it goes off for publication. And everything I, everything I write goes through that process. You said two things that are interesting. I had 10 years of Latin and I also went to Catholic school. And so I understood sentence structure when I, I'm 69. So I yeah. understood, I understood set, sentence structure and I understood the, the formation of that sentence structure from the Latin language, where every Anglo yeah. language comes from. That's not That doesn't happen with kids coming out of J school now or coming out as writers. They write the way they talk. And sometimes that yeah. has some issues with, with the vernacular that, that it goes. But one of the books that I read early on, and, and, and again, I'm a lifelong sailor, but I'm I'm pretty uh, pretty average at, at what I how we sail because it's it's just a, it's an avocation. The Shell Channel Pilot mm. is used by anybody that goes to the English Channel. Mm. How did how just briefly how did that come about? <laughs> well, the uh, ha. I have a series of lectures that I give um, around the around the country, and um, one of them is about the Shell Channel pilot, and it lasts for an hour. So I can't, I can't tell you all that. Suffice it to say that when I was writing, uh, top, when when I produced Top Sail and Battle Axe, um, and it went up for the Best Book of the Sea Award, um, it wasn't going to go there. It wasn't going to get that award. And I was approached by a man called Captain John Coote from the Royal Navy, who had been the youngest submarine captain in the Royal Navy, who was poached by Fleet Street to become uh, uh, an executive for Beaverbrook newspapers, who who, who write the the Times, uh, and sorry, they write the Daily Express and uh, one or two others. And the chief man there was Max Aitken by this time, who was a World War II fighter pilot. And uh, he and Coote got on very well. And Coote used to navigate his racing yacht. And they were great pals. And they did all sorts of things. They raised hell around the town and were a couple of grand chaps. And uh, Coote said to me, he said, I like your style. I like the look of this book. He said, if you put it up for the, uh, for the award, it just so happens that I'm chairman of the committee. I'll give it a fair wind if I can. So I said, right. So um, I met Coote through that. Now, at that time, Coote was the editor of The Shell Pilot. He was the second editor. The first was Adlard Coles, who founded the book in 1935. Coote took it over in 1982. And in 1992, he passed it on to me. And at that stage, the publication changed, the publisher changed, and it went to Faber, to uh, Imre's, who are the big pub publishers of pilot books in, in, in Great Britain. And I took it over, and I was very impressed by Coote's style. It was full of fun. He would always try and see the joke if there was one to be had, and uh, he wouldn't force it. He just had a nice, easy wardroom style. You could imagine him in a chat, some of the glass of rum, and a bit of a chuckle. And um, that suited me, and I picked it up when I took it over and developed it. And I wanted the book to be a good read, as well as something that just told you how to get into a harbour. And, and that's what it became. And actually, I've just passed it over now because I keep my boat in the Baltic Sea. I no longer keep her in the English Channel. So I can't really keep it going. So I've handed over to a young woman called Rachel, who has uh, done a bit of business in her own right. She's driven around in 80-foot racing yachts and been the skipper. And she's a yachtmaster examiner. And uh, she's got a sense of humor. And I think she's going to do a grand job. But I'm really proud of that book. You know, I... I I, I, I am proud of it. It's done well for me, and I think we did well for it too. It's been a good relationship. Is the you, you kind of grew up learning on the North Sea? Um, is the is that the roughest water you've sailed? Well, you know, not really. I mean, it, the, the roughest water was is is, is always going to be the North Atlantic for me. Okay, and. Um, I mean, for mountainous seas, it has to be the North Atlantic. Um, for really nasty, vicious seas, 
it's hard to beat the Denmark Strait between Iceland and Greenland. Um, we went through there a couple of times a few years ago. And we had a miserable time going up there. It was awful, really. Did it give you some respect for the Vikings? A tremendous respect. Yeah, absolutely. And especially when you bear in mind that they didn't have any charts. They had the dimmest idea of latitude and right. no idea at all of longitude. And we're only, well, we're arguably unaware that the world was round. And, 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 and they did all this amazing stuff. They, they were very, very courageous um, men with a very positive can-do attitude. It's an interesting, interesting premise. So success with books leads you into television. 2010, you have a B oh, yeah. BBC documentary, Bolts of Built Britain. Yeah. And that you was kind of got, got involved, your, your, you know, the Boatyard series for Discovery. Yeah. Um, and then eventually Yachts and Yarns. And I understand the Yachts and Yarns much better now having talked to you for 50 minutes. Than well, I that's before. nice. Yeah. And, but how, how did, is it, was, was the, was the television and, and the, 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 the video sort of a, a, an outcasting from the writing? It's just sort of the next transition? Um, well, it happened because I, I was approached by a, a private TV company who were at that time working for, uh, well, Quest Channel, I think. Um, one of those Sky Channels and Quest, they, you know, they all chuck the money in. And um, they wanted to make a series of sort of reality shows called Boatyard, uh, which is available now, actually. You can get these shows now on the internet. It's called the Boatyard Channel. And if you go there, you can find them. And they're really good fun. They, they, were, they were pretty amazing, some of the characters in it. And uh, I fronted that up. Uh, and the guys who ran the company, it was a small company, and they were proper TV professionals, but they were human beings. And we all rubbed along very well together. And really, really, Larry, Larry Walford, who was the, uh, who was the director, he taught me how to talk to a camera. Um, you, you have to be a natural. But like all these things, a bit like being a poet, you know, you can be a natural, but until you've worked at it for 20 years, you're not really going to be any good. Right. And, no, uh, you can that. see yourself, but that's how it is. And, uh, and and Larry taught me how to talk to a camera. And in fact, at one point um, later on, because he also did the Boats That Built Britain series, the uh, the which was BBC full on, and the, uh, the Sky Channel one, the first one we did, um, was, uh, well, that did okay. And it did so well that the BBC approached Larry and asked him if he would make a series, history series, in, with me presenting. So we did Boats That Built Britain. And uh, I remember that was a bit more formal, you see. And there was there was pieces to camera all set up. And you had a proper script and everything. And we did this. We, we did a couple of sessions with these scripts. It just didn't work. It just didn't work. And in the end, I said to Larry, look, this is not going to be any good. And I can remember we were in a remote fishing port in the far northeast of England, a place called Peterhead. And, um, oh, that's a bit of a slice of life, that is. And we, we, we were standing in front of these big pile of fish boxes. And I was trying to present this thing about deep water trawling. And, uh, and I said, look, Larry, this just isn't right. I said, look, because it's when you're doing that sort of television, it's not a linear progression of scenes. You don't start at the beginning of the show and shoot one scene after another till you get to the end. You have to do them all over the place and then the editors stitch it together at the end. So it's difficult for the presenter to know exactly where he is, which is why they give you a script so you can't go wrong. There are certain points you have to get over in this little scene. Well, it didn't work for me. It was, it was wooden. Um, and I said to Larry, look, let's try it like this. You tell me where we are now and where we're going to be at the end of this piece to camera, the little journey we're going to go on while I'm talking to the camera. And, and he said, uh, OK, uh, let's try it. And he, he gave me the brief and I went behind the fish box and thought about it for five or ten minutes. And then I came out and said, right, let's do it. Um, and we just did it like I'm talking to you now. Right. And it worked a treat. And the viewers loved it because it was natural. Um, it wasn't contrived. And, and so that was a real... That was a road to Damascus moment, really, when it came to to, to presenting to camera. Um, and, and when the BBC wound that up in the end, and that was the end of it, um, it's I don't know how it is in the States, but it's always very difficult here to sell anything that smacks of yachting to the television channels. 
because they imagine it's for people who've got lots of money and are, are loaded. And that's nothing to do with us because the BBC is very left of centre politically these days. And um, I mean, they couldn't be more wrong. When we were doing Boatyard, I did one piece to camera in the middle of Yorkshire, that's you know, miles from the sea, standing in a derelict dog track where the dogs race around, which is a completely working class thing, with a broken down power station behind me in a village where everyone was out of work. Mm. And, and a guy had bought a boat in an auction for 200 pounds and was fixing it up with scrap that he was finding all over the place. And that was a proper story. It's a wonderful story. It's a real human can-do story. I really admired the guy. And I, I did this piece to camera, and I pointed out to the camera at that time that anybody who thinks yachting and sailing is for the rich people has just got it wrong. Anybody can do it. All you need is the determination that you will get there, and you can. And uh, so that was that. So that sort of trying to get that past the BBC these days is very difficult. And to be honest, you know, we've not had much luck. And I like doing it. So I thought, well, I'll start a YouTube channel, see how that goes. And so I did. And um, mostly my wife shoots it, but I have a professional cameraman who works with me sometimes. And some of the really big videos, like the Jolly Breeze video, the one about Jolly Breeze, um, the big pilot cutter that won three out of the first five Fastnet races. I mean, that's a fantastic video. And that was made by professional TV people. And, um, and it's an absolute joy doing this. I don't get paid. None of us do. We do it because we love it and because we want to share our joy with the world at large. And we've got 30,000 subscribers. And um, I'm pleased to say that we get a few more each week. So it's a great pleasure. This this show grew out of a, a, a bet, a bar bet. And we've now done almost 100 shows. And we've had, you know, some extraordinary sailing guys on. The best in the world from cruising to racing. I made a, I simply wrote you and you answered and, and we're now talking. And so it's, it's, it's an extraordinary process. But I, I did have a couple of questions on on one thing. What did you learn from your television series about what Britain and what the British have meant to navigation or to uh, naval architecture? That's a tricky one. You have to say we've obviously been pretty, pretty influential because we're an island nation. And for 200 years, we basically ran the show. And, uh, you know, in the years after Trafalgar, the Battle of Trafalgar, where the French and the Spanish and Napoleon basically was defeated by uh, Lord Nelson and the British fleet, um, the Royal Navy ensured world peace, really, and it made sure everybody could get on with their lives. Uh, there had been a little bit of misunderstanding with the American colonies, of course, that came, that came before that. Um, you know, the great thing about that to me is that... Um, the Royal Navy was very hard to beat because we were very good at gunnery. We had a fantastic firing rate. We did a lot of practice and we were good at it. And we were, and, and, and you know, the British jolly Jack Tar in those days, he knew he was going to win and he was a hard man to beat. And so we were, but you, you guys beat us and, and, and you beat us because uh, you actually had, I think, mostly superior vessels. And of course you had the love of freedom because you were being screwed by us. Um, you know, people were being impressed uh, to, to serve in the Navy and there was no there was no need for that. You were being taxed without representation. It wouldn't do. It had to happen. And I'm glad it did. And I wish you well. Um, but um, between us and the French, who designed wonderful fighting vessels, at that period, I think between us, we designed some pretty special vessels. Um, the ships that your lot designed. Uh, the American clippers uh, developed their hull shape from the American pilot schooner, which at the peak of its development, um, or the peak of its extreme development, gave rise to the schooner America, uh, which of course was the uh, forerunner of the America's Cup. And the, I've written a, a huge and quite academic tome about the development of the American pilot schooner and how this happened. It's called Pilots, and it's a great big book. Um, it was published in America as well as here, and uh, by Wooden Boat. The people at Wooden Boat published that. Um, it's out of print now. But uh, looking at the way the Virginia Capes pilot boats developed um, into the 
more seaworthy uh, and blisteringly fast uh, New York schooners, the, the, the America and, 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 the, and the likes, and how they went on to develop into bigger, more powerful boats uh, that were going out past Sable Island and right down to Newfoundland to be the first to put the pilots on ships coming in from Europe. Um, magnificent vessels and a magnificent heritage. And from those, the hull shape went sharp in the bow. And that happened in America then. Uh, the Americans developed that. Uh, and we were still on cod's head and mackerel tail vessels, which were quite refined and were sailing very well. But the, 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 the sharp bow and the sharp rise of floor of the American schooner that went straight into the clipper ships, just beat the pants off everything. It was, a, it was a glorious thing. And those clipper ships were fantastic. We followed them up with vessels like the Cutty Sar, which essentially were better built, uh, lasted longer and went almost as fast. Uh, the American boats very often were built of softwood. They were built for a short period and they went like hell. They'd served their time and then they were done away with. Yeah. So I could go on about this all night. No, 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 no. And I, and I appreciate it. The reason I'm asking the question, there's we have at our, at our club in outside Detroit, we've got a, a gentleman who owns a New York 26, which is built in 19, I think the 1930s. Mm. He's, and he's restored it. And it sits next to a couple of very modern boats. And I still marvel at looking at that boat in the water. And I will jokingly say to somebody walking by to it who doesn't know a lot about sailing, look at that thing. And they'll say, would you believe that that boat's 75, 80 years old? And they'll laugh because it's, it was so beautiful. And it's just, and it's, and being restored. And it's a little bit, and we were talking earlier before the, the, the interview started, we we're talking about golf courses. I understand you don't know much about golf courses, but a Brit in terms of, um, you know, there's a, a bunch of golf courses. Donald Ross built golf courses in the United States that were a hundred years ago that are still being used because the design of golf courses was, was beyond belief. So sometimes we don't look at the beauty of age as much as we should. So when I look at this New York 26, it's just a you know magnificent looking boat. So that was, that was the, part of the question. You're absolutely right about that. And oddly enough, um, yesterday um, I did a short video for a guy um, it was a charity thing. He was he's going to put it out to raise some money for some kids. And, and, and uh, you know, I'm all for spending a bit of time doing that. And the subject he wanted me to talk about was 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 how I would define tradition. And um, oh God, that was a difficult one. I mean, I just talked about tradition for a bit. But the point was, um, I started off with a picture of my first boat, which was a pilot cutter designed, as I mentioned earlier, by the great Colin Archer in Norway um, for the Finnish pilot service. And it was a perfect boat. It had no flaws. It was where, wherever you looked at it from, it was beautiful. And this is something which I think, I hate to say this, and I'm up for being shot down, but I think we're rather losing this. Um, beautiful boats on both sides of the Atlantic um, are getting a little bit harder to find. The boat I have at the moment is a Mason 44, which is a, an American cruising yacht, which is a long keel boat. And when we were looking for her, which we were looking for her when we sold our last pilot cutter, uh, and which was about uh, about 10 or 12 years ago. And we were getting a bit old for gaff cutters, you know, I'm thinking, well, this is all very well, but it's got to come to an end sooner or later. The, you know, 20 ton boats with no winches and things. It's all right when you're 65, but when you're 75, it might be a bit much. So we thought we'd kick it while we were on top. We bought this Mason 44 and we searched for a year to find a boat that, that, that ticked all the boxes and was beautiful. And it was very, very difficult to find a modern boat that did that. And in the end, we, we hopped on an airplane, went to Fort Lauderdale, uh, bought the boat in America, I'm ashamed to say, but that's how it works, you know. You guys still know how to make lovely boats. But um, what really strikes me is uh, the, the sheer beauty of, of, of the American yawl designed by Rhodes or Olin Stevens in his heyday. I mean, these boats, these yachts are, they're peerless, really. You can't beat them. The the yachts designed before World War II by people like Fife and Milne are uh, just gorgeous. Now, L. Francis Herreshoff, my goodness me, look at Ticonderoga. As beautiful a boat as ever sailed the seas. Just can't beat it. With those raking masts and that lovely bow and that glorious stern with that wonderful great American motif on the stern. I saw her 
in the West Indies in 1975. She came past me, she was doing seven knots, and I swear there wasn't a ripple behind her when the water came together. She was so clean and so sweet. And um, yeah, those L. Francis Hereshoff boats are wonderful. I'm not sure whether it was his dad who was Captain Nat Hereshoff. Was it his dad or his uncle? Well, anyway, his... Cap... I think it was his uncle. Well, Captain Nat was a wonderful innovator, wasn't he? But his boats very often weren't that beautiful. Yeah. But my goodness me, the L. Francis ones are showstoppers. And Olin Stevens for Rhodes. These guys, uh, um, yeah. And um, what about John Alden? Malabar, those lovely schooners. They're fabulous boats. And you're not seeing boats like that today. No. Um, over our side, we have we have Charles Nicholson. We have William Fife. You know, William Fife, the, probably the greatest designer of all time. and designed these stunning boats. And... Partly the rules have mitigated against beautiful boats and the designers are always trying to work within the rules. William Fife was. He was designing 23 metres, 19 metres. Um, I've been privileged to sail on, on Mariquita, the 19 metre. That's a 19 metre R, ah, the old international rule from 1906 um, when they designed these fabulous boats that gave room to the 12 metre. The 12 meter yacht that we all know that that was built to that rule so the 19 meter is a big big boat i mean you don't want to think about how long the boom is but to sail on that it's absolute joy it just sails when there's no wind at all yeah. Tom, as a, as a fellow writer i have to ask this question how much of curiosity is a part of you i'm always thirsty for knowledge yeah <laughs> that's that's the answer i want to know more always right. and i never stop learning that's 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 pretty cool. I do have to ask this question though. Motorcycles and sailing, sailing and skiing usually go together, but motorcycles and and sailing are are, are not typically the the you know the the summer activity. So how, just briefly about you and the wife on motorcycles, and do you still have the older Bentley that you used to have? You still have yes, that? I do. I do. I, I I have a 1949 Bentley, which um, I do all the work on myself. I've had it for 12 years and it's never been in a, a professional garage. And we've had the floor out, we've done the clutch, we've done the water pumps, we've had the cylinder head off, and I've driven it to Italy and back from England. So it's a proper job. Right. And it's a, it, it, God, God, it caused a stir in Italy when we turned up that car. Yeah, it was great. Now, your mothers brought their babies out to, to touch it, and beautiful girls looked at their reflection in the lovely, lovely thick coach paint on it. And old men wept as we drove past the bars in the little towns. It was just great. Um, we're going to take her back there one of these days because we had such a wonderful time. So I like machinery. I really enjoy it. I don't like working on boat engines because you're always, you're always trying to get into I'm six feet six, you know, and I'm not, I'm not so bendy as I used to be. And you're trying to crawl into these little holes. What you need is a, is a very small chimpanzee with very long arms and very strong hands. And... Um, Tried to train one of those, but it never worked. And you have to do it yourself. And it's, uh, I don't enjoy it, but it's got to be done. So I do do it. Is there a but I love working on the car and, um, and the motorbikes I used to work on, but the motorbikes today, there's not much you can do. Do you get the same freedom from a motorcycle that you get from a sail, going sailing? Is it the same similar feel? It's, it's not that dissimilar, actually. I, I think, you know, there's something about, I mean, a serious motorbike. I mean, I've had some of these big Japanese road burners with a straight four engine you know really massively powerful and when you come out of a bend on that and you just wind it on and you're gone and it's just this wonderful feeling it's like you're flying because there's nothing much between you and the air coming towards you and it's just it you feel free as a bird and um there is some satisfaction in glancing in the mirror and seeing the cars that were behind you have suddenly like tiny little peas on the horizon but that's not what it's about it's just about this wonderful feeling as you wind it on and just woof off you go. And um, that's not, that's quite similar to uh, when you're in a race boat and you're all sitting on the back trying to keep the rudder in the water and the, the bag fills and off you go down the face of a wave and, you, and, and you're surfing at a ridiculous speed and you're right on the edge of control. And um, it's the same sort of feeling. So, so yes, there is a certain thrill factor that never seems to go away. Yeah. Well, listen, I don't want to take up any more of your time. I appreciate this conversation. I, I keep thinking of the term rock on tour. You tell stories so well, but I've had such a great opportunity to read your, your works. 
and you're a ph phenomenal writer and I, and I appreciate the being able to, as a, again, as a, as a journalist, I really appreciate the, the words that you uh, put on paper and uh, it's meant a lot. And this conversation has meant a lot because this has been really terrific. Well, it's very kind of you to say so. It's kind of you to, to have the conversation. It's a, always a pleasure to me to talk to, to people in, in America, which, as I say, is, is, is a nation which has been kind to us. If anybody wants to know more about what I do, um, they can look at my website, which is quite simply tomcunliffe.com. And on the front page, I think it is there, there's a, there's a portal that will get you into my online club, which costs practically nothing. And um, you get all sorts of stuff about me and what we're doing. And you get to talk to sailors from all over the world. We have a forum like this with 70 or 80 people um, once a month. It comes up next week and it's great fun. So if anybody's interested in that, that's what they should do. Find okay. out about it. Go to the website and have a look. Uh, have you ever, I'm just curious, have you ever sailed the Great Lakes? I never have. Do you know, and I think it's almost time I did. All right. Well, maybe we get you over here to Detroit and we'll take you out sailing. I think that will be fascinating. I've got a couple of members of my club from the Great Lakes, and um, I'm always really interested in what they send me. And uh, I'm, uh, like everybody else, I'm aware of the law, you know, the wreck of the pitch, Gerald, and all the rest of it, and the and the uh, some wonderful songs written by uh, written written by uh, Stan Stan Stan, the Canadian Stan. Stan Rogers. Stan Rogers. There's, okay. there's a whole album called From Fresh Water. And it's all about the Great Lakes. And it's fantastic. Yeah. Really good. I had it in my car when I was driving for a while. Loved it. Tom, I can't tell you how much. Again, I, I appreciate the time and, and the effort. And it's really enjoyable to talk to you. So you have a what's left of a great Friday. And uh, I really, again, appreciate the, the, the few minutes we had a chance to chat. Well, I, I'm really glad you've asked me, and it's been great fun. I've enjoyed meeting you, and um, say hi to the guys and girls. Yeah, well.